So um, that was a very short introduction to Tu Fuegos, and you will be able to, you were able to see where uh, some of the the landscape around the the the, the school project. Um, and now we're going to get a bit of an overview of of, of Fuegos, of how it began and what what, what it's what it's here, what its um, aims are. And this is an interview with Horacio Peretin. Well, Fuegos was established uh, after the earthquake that hit the, the coast of Ecuador in, in 2016. Uh, we uh, at Fuegos uh, were convinced that crisis uh, provides also an opportunity to solve um, social and economic problems such as inequality, uh, environmental degradation, poverty. Uh, we were also convinced that food uh, can be a very powerful engine for social transformation because um, if you think about it, food touches everything. Uh, food is the core of our identity. Food reflects uh, power relationships between rural and urban areas. Food is crucial to promote a good health. So after the earthquake and in the middle of the uh, pandemic, we decided, decided to establish the Iche Food and Hospitality School um, as a space that uh, offered training to women and young people and, and makes them um, ambassadors of social, economic, and cultural transformations that starts with how we produce and consume our, our food. So since then, you know, we have uh, been working with uh, individuals and communities, uh, creating uh, uh, opportunities for them uh, to receive uh, tools and, and also to create a network uh, that share uh, a, a common a common uh, goal, you know, transform that crisis into an opportunities uh, for for people, especially the uh, ones in more need. You know, instead of uh, establishing the food school in a big city. We, we decided uh, to, to establish Iche in the rural area of a small county in the northern coast of Ecuador. When people visit us from all over Ecuador, all over the country, realize that uh, opportunities can and should be distributed everywhere and not just in a few places. Of course, being established in the rural area also brings a lot of challenges. The lack of public services, being far from big cities made difficult to bring equipment and to convince uh, some talented people to come here to work as trainers. Um, however, we are facing these challenges uh, mm -hmm. and we believe that we are proving that it's possible to create opportunities in mar marginalized areas. We, we, we see the most important results in the well-being, in the well-being of people who has visited uh, the food school, students, farmers, um, small entrepreneurs that come at Iche uh, to receive not just training, uh, but also the opportunity to share knowledge, to create a community. Uh, which is for us is, is the most important goal of, of the food school, a community that is com committed to transform, you know, the whole society based on principles such as solidarity, innovation, uh, justice. So for us, the, the main results that we have seen so far uh, are in the faces and in the life of those people who, you know, we are serving at the food school.
we at Fuegos uh, strongly believe that food can be a mean, you know, a, a very powerful mean to transform our communities. Uh, around food, we share our humanity because food reflects what makes us humans, solidarity, creativity, our relationship with nature, our capacity to feed not just our bodies, but also our souls. So we at Fuegos are grateful to, uh, to Sila Dharma, um, um, and we are uh, hopeful that our partnership will enable us to provide individuals, families, and communities with tools uh, to, enable, to enable them to improve their life and, and also to create hope in a very difficult time like the ones we are living in right now. Uh, we, we believe we have also the opportunity in these difficult times to reinvent our, ourselves and food can be a, a powerful engine to achieve that goal. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Zafira. And thank you, Horacio, for that interview. Um, we're going to go straight on and we're going to now um, listen to an interview um, with Valentina um, Alvarez, who is Fuegos' culinary coordinator. And, and she's going to give some more examples of these positive results and, and uh, of, of how food has, it can, can affect social change. And also she's talking about um, her background and how she came to be part of Fuegos. I have always loved cooking, being with food and growing up around it with the influence especially of my great-grandmother. I had the pleasure of living with her a long time with my grandmothers, so always being with them especially around the Manabi oven and stove, always created this attachment to food and especially with that tradition around these family recipes, products and traditions that are also behind food. When I was a girl with my mother, we made things to sell. And after I got married, uh, my husband's family had a hotel on the beach called Coco Solo and there was a restaurant there. So as soon as we got married, we took over the hotel and also the restaurant. So as I always liked the kitchen aspect, I immediately stayed working in that area. I always liked it a lot. And from there, I took it to a more like a beach restaurant. And also, when I... So yeah, and also when I began to study at a distance, uh, I always wanted to study cooking, but at a distance it's difficult to study cooking. So I studied a degree in hotel management and tourism because I was always heading towards cooking. So I tried to ensure that all the research that was requested in the curriculum of the school was oriented to food and above all traditions. Because unfortunately, as everything has been an oral tradition, there is very little written down. And that tradition is in the mouths and in the spirit of the elderly. That this pandemic has shown us that from one day to the next, they may no longer be here. So that has been a great motivation to start documenting, to investigate. There are so many things that one does not know, but there is so much richness that is worth being re-talented, reinterpreted shown, savored. So that's more or less what I've dedicated myself to doing. And we always had this in mind, to have people from the area in our team that, that is our mission that if we are going to have a venture something to do that it should always be with the people of the area so it was our turn in a very intuitive way 
to also take the mothers of the different families from nearby, from Churro, from Aguacate, and teach them in the format of a beach kitchen restaurant. So we had this challenge all the time. So in one way or another, I have always been teaching how to do things and also learning from them, because the ladies there have also taught me a lot of things. It is a nice exchange. There, where it comes from, we also did workshops with the women of the communities, because we saw that they really wanted to put their like little businesses on the side on the side of the road that they sometimes have and they were curious about how to give it a more touristic format and we have always been there with the families especially with Sebastian my husband doing things with them even if they are simple workshops of, for handling small groups or simple dishes with a format of how to serve a tourist Food has that great power to unite. Whenever you eat something with your neighbors or at the table, interesting things always happen. You learn, you communicate, and always, when people are in difficult times, especially with earthquake, I realized this. A lot of people lost their jobs, and that people I knew who maybe worked in other areas would create their small businesses, maybe by doing egg omelets. Then they realized you realize that they resorted to food preparation as a means of subsistence. And this also fits with the Fuego's vision of food as a catalyst for development, because through food, through rescuing it, value chains can be created, because we are not only talking about preparing dishes, but how you can insert products from the area, bringing the producer and the agriculture or peasant closer to the tourists or the people who pass through the semi-urban area for a plate of food, then that is a beautiful thing. That of the um, industry, let's not say industry, of the food activity, of food has this great capacity because to prepare a plate of food, and this is a very important task for a cook, in that proposal that they make, they can be very coherent and attached to the territory or not. Because I can start a business and put whatever, like smoked salmon or spinach, things that have nothing to do with the territory. But I can also bring my proposal and put river shrimp with peanuts and corn. To make this dish, I need local products. So if my gastronomic proposal is local food with tradition, connecting what people eat, I will also connect the territory through the products. So you generate a value chain that is distributed in a more equitable, in a fairer way. It feeds and nourishes this micro-social fabric. And then the food has the great capacity to link, unite and make even the smallest grow. I'm always glad when people who have worked with me in, in my venture, I'm glad to see this. Maybe I haven't grown as much as a business, but I do like that at the same time as my business has grown, the people who work with me have grown. For example, a mother of a family who did not have her own house could already build her own with this, its basic things. So that is the beauty of conscious gastronomic ventures, is that your team or the people who work with you grow along with the business. And the project is oriented in this way, the Fuegos project, that the people, the students, have this very clear vision of how they can undertake something. It can be a restaurant, it can be as a gastronomic cultural teacher or as an enterprise of selling processed or semi-processed products. And they already understand that they have to be consistent with their traditions and with what surrounds them so that it is a really rich space for them and for others. Well, at this school we have a very beautiful area of orchards where there are a lot of varieties, so many, so many varieties that I don't even know where to count them. At least 60 different species, which is not 
The classic orchard, orchard that you imagine, everything is there. What do I know? The carrot line, the lettuce line. It's a very, it's a very eclectic garden, so to speak, because they mix that is traditional foods with plants that are not traditionally consumed. So between the coriander and the basil, you find this called pigweed plant that is a mountain herb, as we say here, a well herb that is edible. So we give it a gastronomic value by putting it on a plate, for example, an empanada. The wild chicory is out there on the ground. We have it in the garden and it is consumed. So it is a space for students to connect with the land, understand the values of caring for plants first, and also to understand that everything that is born is not that it's useless, but that we have not understood it or we have not appreciated it in a gastronomic form. And much of this is taught by our grandmothers who ate. They all tell you that they had a headache. I put some plain compresses on myself. And you look at each plant that grows in a different way. And when they flower, when it bears fruit, when you can consume it, it's so special. So when the students take things out of their salad, out of the garden to make salads, to make the peppers, they have a double satisfaction because they have helped to harvest it to take care of it and then they can taste it. And they can also see how the visitors in the at each year also enjoy it. I think that small movements, small changes are more powerful. They have more pairing value towards the future. For example, when they, the students, have a stage called extensionism, which is one month, and they have a kind of outing to the communities where they share with them and share what they learn, have learned in each and also exchange knowledge. Because each one, there is a contact, there is an exchange of knowledge. So they too, with the communities, learn to talk about non-edible plants and with the, the community, they look at this, look, we eat this at each year. Then they look and, oh, look how cool, and they start consuming, and they start consuming these plants. Then that mainly makes the may be more sustainable because if you already see it in a different way, you don't see it as a weed, like a mountain. You no longer see it as something that you underestimate, that you simply uproot or cut it. If not, what you do is say, oh, I can actually feed myself with this. With a few clovers, I can make a delicious salad. So if positive changes are generated in the community, in the surroundings, and it creates curiosity because they say this, they come with uh, different questions. Oh, my grandma has such a, and such a plant and this is very good for something else or my grandmother has a kind of different plant from this one uh, here in the neighborhood or my neighbor has also got different kind of a chicoria it is a very long so they have which is very long so they already open their minds and are attentive to what is around them then they already generate curiosity when they are already generating curiosity about the world around them you already see there's a change because you see it differently all the efforts that you have made with the school have been exponentially valuable on the subject of aid for tests in these moments of crises with the pandemic it's very important because when such a new project is projected or envisioned there are things that you don't expect them to happen like the pandemic, so you don't have those designated items, so you're in a straight jacket. When there's this, this facility that you have, this generosity that you have had with Fuegos, with Ite, have helped us solve these problems and move forward, especially expanding the range of the budget, for example, for food, for the family meal that we call it. More than like the food for the students, we call it family food because it's a very a way of being a family when we eat, that we come together, we cook together. And improving that budget has also been a beautiful change because it has allowed us to have more supplies. And with these inputs, also making the family meal preparation exercise and the practice and reconnection with our ancestors, with what our ancestors ate, the opportunity to do this we're going to make this meal the boy maybe that has been in the school that he has never eaten but maybe his grandmother has so having this range um, of food a little more open thanks to your support has allowed us that the support 
in, in this volume, it might not seem to you like very big or that it's not enough, but for us, this help is everything. It is a lot. That is a meaning to go from one a slightly tighter scheme to open up a range of possibilities and food for above for all of us. The students enjoy it, they take advantage of it a lot, and they have even have room to say, well, we can propose this type of menu for the following week because there is already this flexibility with economic issues which are very limiting in many times and this aspect they have served and really thank you from me from the students they also appreciate it and for us it is something super is that it connects with equally beautiful projects such as the ones of the Susira Dharma it's like a great link I a person who would suddenly have been left in a vicious circle of poverty, a vicious circle of abandonment, it generates an opportunity to be someone, a professional, to allow him to even think that he can be much more, he can be a community leader, and through his delicious food, he is, this, this is fabulous. When we more people connect, more people who in some way enrich this project, you say, wow, there are quite a few people who are doing nice things for their community, for their country, for the world, for each other, for the other person, because I think that goes further. Well, it happens to me with food, and there is a task of being a little bit, not a teacher, just a facilitator, a way of understanding your environment, a different way, not so individualistic. But if everyone grows in our community, our environment, our family will work better, your ecosystems, your environment works better. And it's cool that things like this happen. Things as small as the action network has a lot of impact. One would think that it doesn't, but it really does. In other words, I think that with the change of one, one life of the a student, with the change of only one, a lot has already been achieved. It is already a profit. And if everyone manages to do something interesting with their endeavors, then that is fabulous. Thank you, Zafira. And many thank many thanks to uh, Valentina. I don't know if she's with us yet, but um, it was really nice to talk to somebody who was so enthusiastic and passionate about what she does. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't we, we, you know, I could have played the whole interview, but we don't have time. We didn't have time for all of it. Um, I, I had some comments from Spanish speakers that the audio was not very clear for them. I'm very sorry about that. I will um, put on YouTube all of these videos separately so that you can go back and listen to the ones that weren't very clear. Um, but we're going to carry on for now. We're going to now watch some testimonials from different um, people who have participated in each in the Ichi Food School, Fuegos' Food School. And also we're going to hear some testimonials about the um, their outreach placement or extensionism, extensionismo, as it's called in Spanish. Um, so here is, yeah, we'll just play this video and I'll shut up. <laughs> Testimonials, the Iche experience. Alejandro Chamorro, there are a lot. There are a lot of pure Manabi techniques that Noema can learn. 
the use of the stove, the different techniques, the fire inside the stove, the ingredients that you have here, the proximity of the ingredients. This is an opportunity for students to understand Manabí cuisine firsthand as a hot cuisine. Valentina Alvarez then opens the horizon for them so that with the Manabí product, with ancestral Manabí techniques and applying avant-garde techniques, they can see this view of the Manabí cuisine dressed in gala. It was an incredible experience. To tell you the truth, it was complete. Highlighted the best of the Manabi gas Manaba gastronomy. The dishes had everything we expected. Flavor, textures. The balance of the menu was incredible. And gathering organized by... Siempre sorprende. Al inicio puedes pensar que solo vas a aprender a cocinar platos más ricos, pero la formación en hecho es mucho más profunda, teniendo siempre en mente el propósito de llevar nuestra comida manadita al mundo. Trabajamos en intensas y emocionantes jornadas, mientras experimentamos todo lo que debería vivir alguien que quiera tener su propio restaurante o estar en una cocina premiada internacionalmente. El aprender haciendo que hace diferente a la escuela Ich es el que nos dará la oportunidad de egresar con conocimientos y habilidades que podremos poner en práctica en distintas áreas de la gastronomía y de la hospitalidad. Um, become one of the pioneers of this new cocina manavita. We accept um, people who would like to participate. Since I remember, I can remember I always loved cooking. I always knew that I wanted to dedicate myself to gastronomy and I was willing to fulfill my dreams, but I did not know very well how to approach it. At the age of school, I discovered how to develop my knowledge of Manabi gastronomy to take it to the next level. My experience at the age of school has been truly challenging, a collection of challenges and experiences that I had never experienced before. This is a constant reminder that we are prepared to be one of the best in the world and we, we're preparing to be one of the Western world, and we see it in, throughout our training by cooking alongside renowned chefs with many awards and recognitions. One day you are learning with the best historians with about Manabi culture, and another day heritage, and the next with peasant associations that produce the best chocolate in the world. All these experiences have shown me that what I am capable of, and I am convinced me that we will become an international culinary destination. Become one of the pioneers of the new Manabi cuisine. To apply, complete the registration form. Send your application until September 30th. From the classroom to reality, I have been able to use what I have learned in my business and the networking opportunities that Ichi has given me to talk with great entrepreneurs and chefs. I take with me the tools to be able to implement it in my own businesses and maintain the essence of Manabi, but transforming it to make it more current and more attractive nationally and internationally. Become one of the pioneers of the Manabi cuisine. We accept applications until September 26th. Request more information at info at fuegos.ec. Extensionism of the School of Food and Hospitality, Iche. The extension period is a program that students complete in the sixth month of training that we have here at Iche School. The purpose of this process is to make the students have contact with the community and share knowledge. The knowledge that each one of the communities where they go and visit has, and also the technical, practical and ancestral knowledge that they have already acquired in each of the subjects that they have been seen here for me, the extensionism was a very pleasant experience since I was able to take my knowledge acquired here at the Ichi School and share it there with the community, with the kitchen people. We ourselves went to the orchard or the garden with them to harvest the pineapples. They have their organic products, so we went to harvest the pineapple and be able to make a desert and be able to leave it implemented there in the place. 
The chosen communities were a number of six, San Jacinto, San Isidro, Rambuche, Bellavista, Cojimíes, and Prisé. We are in the Bellavista sector. It belongs to the canton of Hama, canton of Hama, Manabí. They have come here with new things that they have explained to us. And we have also, also explained something about what is prepared here as a snack. My experience in extensionism was special because mutual learning could be achieved. Both I, I learned from them and they from me. We also implemented certain cocktails with my partner using aromatic plants that were in the area. Thank you for coming to this beach. You're welcome, very welcome. We hope you have a good experience. Thank you. Thank you, Zafira. Um, I realise that this is a lot of information. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of input here. So I hope that if you do have questions that you're, you're, you're writing them down um, so we can have a good discussion afterwards. Um, the final content that we're going to show you before we go on to introduce the Fuegos team members and let them kind of speak for themselves and, and, and for you to ask the questions you have. The final input is an interview with uh, with Michelle, um, who was who was with us. So she'll be able to add to anything she she says here. So um, yeah, let's just go ahead with this interview now um, with Michelle. Hello, brothers and sisters in Sulu. I'm Michelle O'Fried. I have been living in Ecuador since 1972. I have three Ecuadorian children. I studied public health nutrition before I came to Ecuador, but after having seen hunger in West Africa, where I lived for a few years before I came to Ecuador. Uh, so that started me off, but I guess what really began was maybe those talents that God gave me that have to do with flavors and smells. I, you know, I'm just passionate about food. So I imagine I studied my profession to, to justify my own personal passion and talents. So what am I doing in Fuegos? Well, after decades of being in Ecuador, and working with different NGOs, many of them women's NGOs, and almost always working with women's groups, and women's groups of people who didn't have a lot of resources. But remember, in Ecuador, since we're on the equator, we can have fresh fruits and vegetables, everything fresh, all year round. It was nice to get out of the U.S. where in that time there was a war, and we certainly hope there will not be another war. It was the war in Vietnam that I was not in agreement with. And there was also all of that food out of cans. So I loved being able to have the, the opportunity to eat real food and often to get to know the person who was growing that food or who had fished or the, the person who, whose eggs I was buying from, or whose chickens I could stew the hens, or, or as chickens I could just create anything I wanted, always with products that I could trust. So after working for NGOs, including the United Nations, and you know, just the way God moves things in your life, I found myself in a situation where I could be part of uh, a new NGO that we que organizamos para ayudar a lidiar con after a very bad earthquake in the province that's called Manabí. That earthquake was from 2006. So Fuegos is an NGO that works from food. It works from food to make social transformation. And since I've always worked with, with women's groups and with aspects of gender, it, and since I've always worked also with women's groups and community groups, 
and groups that didn't have many resources in the terms that the first world might think about, but were full of, most of them had some land, most of them could grow something, and they still appreciated the traditions of their grandparents. So it wasn't a society, and still isn't in most of the country, a society that has bought into the new food um, transition, <laughs> the transition into eating out of uh, the agro-industrial sector. Here we can eat real food. So in Fuegos, that's what we do. We help through our school youth to be able to learn how to put up their own businesses. Many of them come from families that have food businesses. Those youth are learning how to eat in a very beautiful, healthy, sustainable way, straight from the land that's close to them. Those communities and those students are being able to appreciate their own food and perhaps create it in new, very exciting ways. Because in Fuegos, we talk about the importance of presenting traditional food Alamabi, which is famed for being the vet, best food in Ecuador. And Ecuador has incredible food all over the country. We in Fuegos have almost as our slogan, new food from Manabi. And it's new because of the innovations that we're doing. Uh, most people in Manabi no longer eat many vegetables and are not used to eating raw salads. Maybe those raw salads would have brought amoeba, uh, amoebas into their lives. So now that they can grow their own products and that our students are realizing how delicious they can be. One other aspect of that Susila Dharma is helping us with in this new year of work is peace culture, culture of peace. Manavi has had huge amounts of machismo. We say that in English. And on top of that, people were born almost with machetes in their belts. So it's a society that has not learned how to come to conflict resolution through dialogue. The first thing that people think of is who's going to fight whom and how strong are they. That, of course, is a problem in our school. It's a problem in the area where it's so prone to earthquakes. So we're very, very thankful for Susila Dharma for giving us the chance to work on culture of peace there in Manabi. It's a different world from the world most Ecuadorians have even grown up in. When you grow up in the Andes, you have community support in, to resolve conflicts. I'm not saying that they, they aren't sometimes resolved violently, but it, it's been talked about and the whole community has come up with a decision. Where in one of me, it's very individualistic and almost solitary way of life. So there is so much that I am learning because when I came to Ecuador, I was living in, in the middle of the Andes. And the work in Manabi is work in a different world. A world that has so many needs and also so much potential and so much delicious Mind health is a new concept. Health has always been viewed from the health sector, which is based on the learning of professionals, doctors, 
nurses and usually health centers and hospitals. That's a kind of health that does not even fit public health standards. But unfortunately, in almost all of the world, health has been viewed from um, the health infrastructure rather than viewing it as part of life. So One Health brings together the traditional health sector with much more focus on preventive health, public health focus, along with the what people in the development world are considering a whole new aspect, which is sustainability. The food that I eat, how much plastic is involved in it, am I drinking really safe, beautiful spring water out of a plastic bottle? It, it has to do with the foods that I'm eating. Are they coming from healthy ecosystems, from regenerative agriculture? And these are all new aspects of health. So in One Health, we link the health sector with everything else about life, particularly the agricultural sector that hasn't usually combined consumption, which comes from their sector, with health. We are so lucky to have very good relationships with the United Nations, with FAO, as well as with WHO, who are trying to bring about these new models linking production with consumption. And in each day, Fuegos, through our food school and our restaurant, were able to put these things into practice. Our students every day cook their own meals, that they are trained how to have healthy meals using healthy local products. The project that Fuegos wrote for Susila Dharma 22 is a project that our other funders who are big funders like the Inter-American Foundation or the Italian Ecuadorian Foundation for Sustainable Development. Those funders don't fund the kinds of human things that we are so thrilled that Susila Dharma can help us fund. For example, Culture of Peace. We couldn't find one of those big funders, or if we put it in our project, we would know that we wouldn't get the funding to do that. So to write a project to get a big funder, we had to know the kinds of things they would fund. But to have a project that works well, that follows Patak's idea of perfecting humankind, we can do it with funding from Susila Varma. To begin with, food is something that everybody deals with, hopefully, at least three times a day. We all eat. And 38% of all of greenhouse gases come from the food system. People think it comes from, uh, if we take a car or a bicycle. Part does, but imagine 38% comes from the food system. So the choices we make in our own households can bring about a huge improvement in climate change. Climate change is one of the aspects that we can hope to address in Fuegos by the kinds of choices of the foods that we eat. Our approach to climate change is to have our project located locally, to use local food, and to train people to be able to earn money in their own localities. They're using public transportation, using 
food locally and training communities, families, and our own students to eat locally, we are addressing climate change. Remember I told you about the 38% of uh, emission of greenhouse gases brought on by the food system? Well, we operate with a, the food system in a very different way. So we do view that we are helping uh, um, mitigate cl climate change through working with food. Also, one thing I didn't mention is that we, all, for our restaurant and for the food that we consume in teaching and in eating of our students, all of that food is bought locally and hopefully from groups of farmers or groups of fishing people or individual families who raise their own pig or raise a few ducks or raise a few chickens. We're not entering in to the huge food system that operates out of either Guayaquil or Quito, where everything is brought to one center and then goes out. We're operating, helping local people be able to sell their products directly. And of course, we can pay a decent price, which when you're going through all those intermediaries, never happens. So that's another way that through food and the way we operate food at our school, we are uh, helping the economies and also helping climate change. Thank you, Zafira. Thank you for putting those videos together. Um, and thank you, Michelle. Michelle, would you um, would you like to say any more before we open up to questions, or would you like people to ask you the questions that might have come up as they have tried to absorb all that uh, fascinating content? What, 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 how would you like to do it? Thank you, Solon. Just to welcome you all, we at Fuegos are so happy to be able to share with you what you are helping us do and to involve you all in this very exciting, challenging, and hopefully a, a, a venture that, that changes people from the inside and through what they eat. So I'm here ready for any questions. There, as you can see, we have something that takes all kinds of energy to keep going, and we're there doing it. And it's amazing that you've done so much in quite a short amount of time. Um, our, our restaurant began in July last year, and it's that quite often now we have, have to turn people away. You make a reservation online, and quite often we don't have the space to be able to receive you, even being in a rural area. So we're very happy with the kind of response we're getting. So that means you've already got a very good reputation. We're, we would like to also have an international reputation, which isn't so good for sustainability, bringing people in from foreign countries. But at the moment, we have a lot of local support. That's amazing. I see we have Martin on the call as well. I don't know, Martin, if you want to introduce yourself. Just sure, putting you I'd on like the spot. To, and, um, <laughs> I'll do it beginning first in English and, and then in Spanish, because I'd like to speak directly as well to the Spanish speaking people. Uh, my name is Martin Declair. I'm originally from, uh, from Canada, from, from Quebec, from Montreal. I've lived in Latin America for uh, quite a few years. Uh, of which several in Ecuador. I, I have an Ecuadorian family right now. Um, and um, I've been mostly involved in um, social development projects around Latin America, although for a time when I was back in Canada for a brief period, I also uh, helped organize solidarity and social projects in Africa and in several countries in Africa and Asia. And um, being part of the uh, 
all of the time I worked in the International Development Cooperation, it was around food issues. I worked for the World Food, Pro World food Program for the FAO. I worked with uh, Oxfam, ActionAid, two big international NGOs that have food security and food sovereignty as part of, as well as integrated or holistic agricultural development as part of their their platforms. And as while I was working as a, a regional director for a Danish NGO called EBIS, which is now the Danish part of Oxfam, Oxfam, excuse me, I became involved in first supporting social gastronomic projects, working a, a food project with the street children in Lima. And then I learned about the food movement there, which has been very successful. And then I had the uh, privilege to, uh, to work on a project, a food school, which has inspired in some ways Ichi, although Ichi is very different because it's taken an example of the food school in Bolivia and taken it to, uh, adapted it to the local level and the, the present circumstances. And that food school I worked on together with a restaurant ended up um, spawning 10, 12 uh, community uh, food schools together with cafeterias in Bolivia and two in Colombia. So it was quite a successful project. And that's what we're basing our project on together with a lot of other factors, especially what Michelle has talked about concerning health. But I don't wanna go too much further on that. I think uh, I would prefer to, uh, to answer questions. Y me gustaría mucho dar un saludo a los hispanoparlantes que están aquí hoy día con nosotros. Qué gusto conocerles, aunque sea virtualmente. Y les damos una invitación calurosa para que nos visiten cuando pueden. And I just said it's an, uh, a privilege. I, I, I'm very thankful here. Uh, we hope that you can visit sometime. I extended the, the invitation first to the Spanish speakers because I imagine they're closer to, geographically to us than others, but hopefully you can all come and visit us. And I also wanted to mention something that for me it has been, um, I don't know the proper way to explain this, but it has been an extraordinary experience for me to, uh, to learn about uh, Susila Dharma, to uh, work with you, and I thank very grateful for your support. But that has also added, that has also led me to a uh, a, a, a change, a big change, a positive change in my life because by working with Susila Dharma, thanks to your support, two Fuegos, I have also become Subud. So I really would like to thank you for that. And that is because I had the opportunity to, uh, to get to know you, some of you, and Susila Dharma through your cooperation. Través de su cooperación con Fuegos. You put the Suwood philosophy in practice through the different projects you're supporting. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that you've joined Suwood. Welcome. <laughs> That's really nice to really nice to hear, um, and it's nice to meet you virtually. Um, okay, D shall we go on to questions, Michelle? And uh, Martin is Valentina with us. I know she. She was wanting I didn't to say I didn't see her. I, ah, I don't no. see her. Okay, she's you know, this is right before lunchtime and oh. sa Saturdays are big business days. We have Laura Alvarez, is that her? No? Yes, yes. Hola Valentina. Quieres saludar? No, maybe not. <laughs> she might be busy. Um, okay, well, why don't we go along uh, go ahead with some questions? Um, please put your hands up. I will try and see you either your virtual hands or otherwise. I can't see you all at the same time on the screen though. So virtual hands is better. Yeah. Hola Valentina. Hola. <laughs> Hello Valentina. How are you? Glad to see you. Nice to see you too. Okay. Shall we go ahead with, anybody got any questions? Yes, yes. Estoy preguntando si los otros tienen pre pre preguntas para nosotros. Anybody else has questions for us? Para vosotros, para, para ustedes. 
uh, questions for you. Okay, Elaine. Elaine has a question. Go ahead, please, Elaine. So it was, thank you so much. It was so wonderful to see the, the beauty of so many people working in so many different ways with food in your project. It was full of life. I wish I could have tasted everything we were seeing. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question about the cultural place of meat in Ecuadorian food. Uh, as a Brazilian, I know that there is a lot of meat consumed in many countries of South America, and I'm not sure about Ecuador. And I also am involved in health education and I'm aware of the very many issues around uh, the consumption of meat and heart disease and cancer. And I'm just wondering how that works into this um, very complete way of honoring local food and uh, um, having people be able to eat more locally. So I, I just wondered if you could speak a little bit to that. Valentina, per, uh, perhaps you, you can first talk about that and then I will address the meat consumption in Ecuador patterns. Este, so, should I do it in Spanish or English? I'm not very good in English. Valentina, if you prefer to speak um, Spanish, you can speak Spanish because yeah, we have interpretation. Perfect. Oh. Perfect. In, in Pero lentamente, lentamente. Slowly, Valentina, very lentamente. slowly. She has a tendency <laughs> to get so excited. I know. <laughs> Here in Manabi, there is the we consume meat, not so much of um, like beef. More of it is um, pig meat, a lot of um, bird as well, like chicken, and especially here in the coast, there is a consumption of the fish of um, prawns as well, which is part of the diet. With respect to the pigs, I have noted that it has been changing a bit. There is a lot of consumption of cerdo criollo called um, like pig that is being um, raised within the different families. Uh, sadly, it has changed a bit because there has been an introduction of the types of pigs that is um, raised with ballot, like food that has been like grains and stuff that isn't exactly like the normal way that done here in the, the different places like the houses. This doesn't have such a nutritional value and also the f value the, uh, that is so nice of the a pig that is of the, of the house we, where you give them the, the leftovers of the house and all this, you don't um, get this because this comes from the industrial uh, aspect. They don't tell you with this change what there is inside of the food that is given to these other pigs raised industrially. In the aspect of the um, beef, of there is not a care that is so technological it's it's maybe more friendly which is a cow that has um, grown in open uh, fields there are no hormonal treatments and stuff but there are already options of um, consumption of happy cows here in Nietzsche, which is the offer of this type of meat of uh, cow meat which is a product of the um, growth of the cow that has been able to have a very good and happy life when you're going to kill them already there there's already a bit of this concept in the zone of of it being more I mean uh, luckily there is something that there's not much difference in the human aspect of the art of the fishing if it's not adequate will also um be bad for the environment and destroy a bit so it's good that the so that the food can be good and nutritious and delicious but it also has to have a good impact environmentally that is it thank you, thank you. Mm. yes uh just to give you all of you uh an indication of cons consumption of animal protein in ecuador the last national study we had, which was based on in presence interviews in 
90,000 households in the entire country, we learned that most Ecuadorians are barely eating any animal protein. This is a poor country. The source of their protein is rice, which makes you know the very, rice has about nine grams of protein per 100 grams of food product. So that, that gives you an indication of the small amount of animal protein that is being consumed in Ecuador. In, in cities, you, you find larger consumption. In rural areas, quite often people are vegetarians without ever saying they are. Maybe on a weekend, they would eat something or if they went to a market, they would eat something, but in their own homes during the week, Quite often, maybe they would eat an egg from their own chicken or perhaps cheese from their cow or the cow of a neighbor. So this was, was a vegetarian culture to begin with. And still in Manabi, we have many, uh, the dish in fact, that Valentina presented to us during her interview was a dish that at the moment is made with some seafood, but Valentina presented it to us in the, the original traditional way, which was the, um, it's made with many vegetables and it's all held together with this wonderful creamy flavor that you get from ground peanuts. And these peanuts are grown on their land right there in Manavi. The, the dish is absolutely wonderful. And I, I was very impressed that Valentina, to show off her skills, showed us this very traditional vegetarian dish. Uh, in fact, it's even a vegan, vegan, vegan dish, come to think of it. Also, just in terms of cancer and red meat consumption, all of the studies that have been done to show that are done in countries where their source of red meat is, are not family grown pigs, for example. So we at Iche are trying, like Valentina said, trying to go back to the production techniques. And it's all our, I, I have never seen on our menu beef, in fact, on our menu for our, exactly, our, our restaurant doesn't have any beef. And we never set that up as a policy. It's just not part of the culture. We, we do have certain things that come from cows, which also do produce methane and, and bad gas emissions. But in, in general, most poor cultures were vegetarian cultures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, yeah, thank you, Michelle and Valentina. Um, so it sounds like you have quite a low carbon footprint um, for now, at least. Um, I have a question here from Isabel Cristina, who says, how do you reach the United Nations? The United Nations was, in, was mentioned, I think, by you, Michelle. What is your connection with the United Nations? Well, both, both Martin and I have worked for the United Nations. I also worked for the w, WFC, the World Food Programme. But, but right now, I, I'm going to turn it over to Martin to talk about how our relationship with the United Nations is going right now. And of course, a lot of this is, is in terms of the sustainable development goals. I'll pass it over to you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, I think uh, what Michelle just mentioned is... Um, the basis of our relation to the United Nations. Of course, we're always trying to, uh, to um, form alliances with the different projects that are being carried out. We've spoken to the FAO about what we're doing. We've spoken to the World Food Program and uh, they know about us and we know about them. And we, uh, we also try to, uh, in some way, to influence what they're doing and also learn from what they're doing and especially to avoid duplicating uh, the work that's being done. That's something that, as a lot of you probably know, that happens in, in development projects or social projects, that there's a lot of, uh, of duplication where you have more than one organization working with this same population, the same communities, 
doing the same thing. So we try to, to make sure that our actions are complementary to the other uh, actions that are, ta- that are taking place. And as well, I think I should mention that the fact that uh, food is very strongly linked to production, agricultural and, and fishery production in, in our region. And Manabi, as you've heard and seen, is a, has a, is a very diverse province. It has a bit of everything. And um, we, uh, we know from experience in other countries and what Fuegos is trying to do is that in order to have, to improve the gastronomic offering, the culinary offering, to have an, a good and tasty and healthy dish, it needs to be uh, based on healthy local products. So we're also working with producers. And that means liaising not only with United Nations, but with other NGOs and foundations that are working directly with, with producers. And in that way, we are trying to, in some way, bring it all together towards our, our eventual goal of promoting the food of Manabi as a means of creating a social and economic transformations, as Horacio explained in, in one, the answer to one of his questions. And finally, as Michelle mentioned, I believe we are aligned with eight or nine of the sustainable development goals that have to do with what we're working. So in that way, we're also aligned with what the United Nations has proposed with the goal to, uh, I think it's in 2030, to reach these different goals. One of them is, of course, to, uh, to end poverty and end hunger and a lot of other goals that have to do sustainable development goals around the environment and around creating a decent and uh, dignified employment and several others that I won't mention, but in that way we are aligned not only with United Nations, but as well with different organizations that are carrying out social uh, projects in Manabi and uh, also working, uh, that, are, that are more specialized in working with producers in sustainable development, which together with uh, responsible consumption forms the basis as well as what Wagos wants to do. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Um, we have another question here on the chat. We, uh, we, have not, we had one from Isabel who was asking, what is the age range of the students? So um, Michelle and Valentina have answered that. Michelle said the, the mean age, uh, the average age is 28 to 30 years. And Valentina says between 18 and 45. So those answers do not contradict each other. Um, mm. Um, oh, is there a question that's why are there no um, older adults? Interesting. Can I uh, respond? Um, the 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 thing about the the the, the, the range about age about for the rango de edad is basicamente it's para... basically to reconnect to the new generation with the Manavita traditions that are not there anymore so we need to the not the we need the knowledge and the techniques of our grandparents to go back to the roots and in the classes that we give many of the students even if they're from Manabi they would not they do not men, know many of the preparations that for me are elemental so this is why we prioritize first of all the youth we also have a preference if it's a female um gender and also their vulnerability if it's a rural zone, and also if it's their first opportunity to access these types of studies. So all of this is in the matrix, like the option of the selection, because what we want to do is, we could at some point do workshops for older adults, but the idea of this aspect of the program is to vinculate or put this ancestral knowledge with this knowledge of the day with uh, food our generation doesn't know about this so this is why we focus more on this range of um, age range also i might add our donors our big donors also required that and that is part a part of the priorities of the united nations that sustainability be something that youth are involved in Okay, thank you. If I also um, may oh, add Martin. something, mm-hmm. uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
I think uh, that it would be so, uh, uh, an idea to explore eventually offering offering um, courses to uh, to third age people to uh, golden age people uh, adultos mayores as you say in Spanish and and also to bring some of those people into uh, to actually teach and exchange knowledge. Yes. As, as yeah. Valentina explained, that's something we're already doing. And I, I would also like to take the opportunity, if I may, just to mention something associated with this, is that the school, each school in Fuegos is a center from which irradiates all sorts of, uh, of, of workshops, of training across the province. I think that's very important to consider. It's not only the, the contact that we have with the community, our outreach is not limited to that uh, month of what we call extensionism, which is like rural service, which was explained in one of the videos where the students go out into communities and they share their knowledge with uh, local restaurants and eateries, but they also learn from what's what the eateries are doing there and from uh from elderly people they, they gain knowledge from from seniors and from 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 abuelas from grandmothers as 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 uh valentina mentions as well we also have a project which is a we're building the first um responsible sustainable uh, tour, gastronomic culinary tours or tourism route in the north of Manabi where the school is, is located. And we, from the school, we are providing training and support to more than 125 small food businesses, 80 producers, both of agriculture and, and fishery. And in that way, we are also working towards re outreach and, and working in the community, gaining knowledge from the community and passing on knowledge from the students themselves and from what we have learned in general. So I think, and in that way also getting back to the original question, uh, golden age people are also very much involved in what Fuegos is doing. Okay, does that answer your question, Isabel? I think so, she says thank you. Um, there, there was a question earlier from Suzanne on a different subject. So this is going back to the subject of um, climate change. Um, so she asks, what fuels are being used at the school for cooking? I imagine that there are, is a lot of sunshine in the area. Is solar or wind generated <laughs> electricity available for use in the school and on a small scale for small businesses? Who wants to answer <laughs> that? Michelle? I'll answer it. Thank you for giving us Another challenge, Suzanne. <laughs> it would be wonderful. We, we haven't gotten into all of that yet, but there are just so many things we would love to do. Yeah, it sounds like you're such a multifaceted uh, <laughs> enterprise already. Uh, and there, yeah, there, there is so much to right. But it's definitely an area that, that we need to develop. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, and, and it's also to do with money, isn't it? Because you know that that that's the that's the kind of thing that needs a, a lot of forward investment to to get it um, operational. Right. Mm. right. Okay. Is anybody else got a question? Emmeline has raised her hand. Emmeline, go ahead. First of all, big congratulations to you and the team. It's amazing work you're doing. Um, I was wondering if you could explain a bit more about the kinds of training sessions or activities that you will be partaking in for this culture of peace um, aspect of it. I'm just a bit curious and I'm sure um, others as well. Thank you. Should I go first? Martin? Sure, Michelle. Uh, okay. Um, there, there is uh, an a completely un informal organization called the Alternatives to Violence Project. It began in the 70s 
uh, uh, at the request of prisoners in high security jails in New York City. These prisoners realized that when new prisoners came in, that, that they were really killing themselves and that there was more killing among themselves in these jails. So they asked the Quakers, uh, a, a group that has always considered themselves pacifists, to help give them training of how not to be violent. Uh, that training has now been well established. I think there are groups of AVP Alternatives to Violence Project in 60 different countries around the world. I, I am a facilitator in one of those groups, in the group, of course, here in Ecuador. And AVP has been called in, only operates where people choose to, to, to want to call them in. We are all volunteers, so nobody can earn money from, from this uh, enterprise. And for example, we were called into Rwanda after the genocide. People realized that the, that the, the series of workshops that we can offer make a huge difference. So we're going to be working with some of that team. Since, since I'm part of Fuegos, I will not be a facilitator for our own group, but Susila Dharma is helping us with that. So part of the culture of peace will be following the guidelines and really the workshop techniques all based on experience and participation. Uh, a lot of the techniques are are popular education techniques that were developed by Paulo Freire, but always geared toward being able to respond to conflict in a new way. And truthfully, although the Alternatives to Violence Project is not a religion at all, um, we talk about the poder transformador, the transforming power. And that transforming power being in Subu, I call God. But because so many people over their lives have had bad problems with the institutionalized God within the Alternatives to Violence Project, we call it the transformative power. And we are going to be able, thanks to Susila Varma, to hire someone in a part time position to carry out the different new tools that people will be trained on a, on a daily basis to be able to do that follow-up work, which is truthfully one of the problems of AVP because you know, all being volunteers, we, we present really good things and sometimes they get followed out and sometimes they kind of fall through the cracks. So we are very hopeful that we will be able to make a, a big difference having somebody on our staff, even as a part-time position, who'll be able to follow through on that. Thank you, Emmeline. I, I'm very happy for your question. I like that transformative power. I think I might use that. <laughs> did Martin, did you want to add something? Or otherwise we, we do have another question. Yeah, I could ahead. just perhaps add that the uh, culture of peace uh, as, as Michelle explained, that will be uh, a, it'll be a, it'll be present in the in the uh, in the school, and not only for the students, but as well for the staff. I think that's very important yes. to mention for everybody that working together because we're forming a community, a family. We're now all together about 25, 26 people, and as in any human society or situation, sometimes conflicts do arise, <laughs> and we do have a situation in the school where we have uh, almost half of our students who do not live close to the school and are living uh, together in a, in a student residence. And so that also presents another challenge in terms of uh, not only uh, studying and working together, as in the case of the other students or staff, but also living together. So the culture of peace will be part of a holistic approach to providing psychological 
support and uh, coaching as well. And uh, just having someone to, to speak to. In, in many ways, uh, an extended version or an, a, of what a, a high school or university counselor does when they not only talk to students about uh, their professional or problems or problems associated with their studies, but as well, a lot of times, um, personal situations come into play. And it's always good to have someone who's available to talk to and, and mediate using cultural pieces as, as a very important tool. Um, I think uh, it was mentioned in our proposal that Manabi is a very machista society. There's a lot, unfortunately, of uh, domestic violence. Um, women do not have the kind of... Uh, voice that they should have. And we're trying to promote those kinds of values as well in our school. Um, what we're really trying to do is one of the goals of the school, aside from providing employment opportunities, either through uh, finding, being able to find jobs as a graduate of each school or uh, starting up or improving their own small businesses that many of the students have, is to gain this perspective of a commitment to society, to their community, to their families, to learn new values and to also be able to transmit those values to other people. And to, as we, as we spoke about the power of food to change, this goes together with the transformative power that, uh, that Michelle was talking about. And I would say that's one of the main goals of the school. What will our students become? ambassadors of Manabi food, but also ambassadors of, and, and the bearers and transmitters, I don't know if that's the proper word, of these values that we're, we're trying to, uh, to pass on to the students and to the staff who work at Fuegos. Great, Emma, um, has that answered your question? Definitely, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we're getting some great questions here. We are running out of time. Um, there are a couple of people with their hands up, so I'm going to take their questions and then we'll have to wrap up, I'm afraid. So um, the next question was from Vincent. Hi, everybody. Um, just wanted to say a comment, really, about um, from the point of view of, of uh, a Susila Dharma national uh, representative, we've funded uh, supported this project um, along with other SD nationals and it's been a great pleasure to do so over the last two or three years. Uh, we wanted to just, uh, well, I wanted to just sort of explain that um, one of the things that really impressed us about this project is, is how um, adaptable they have shown themselves to be in this very difficult period over the last couple of years particularly. Um, so they've been very good at actually asking for our approval to actually say, you know what, this situation has caused us to mean we can't actually do the family homestay program we were hoping to do with our students because of COVID. So this is what we would like to propose instead. And so they worked on the, the kitchen gardens and then they've been working on safe COVID practices um, and now we're supporting the culture of peace program and the the one health program so I suppose I, I, a huge congratulations really just to be able to see that adaptability working and the way that you are networking with lots of different arms within the community thinking very much about the diverse impacts that you have um, it means a lot to us, and I think it's a very good demonstration of, of how a Cecilia Dharma project can, can behave, you know, out there in the world. Um, what I was also struck by is that um, a couple of years ago when Danica, um, the Cecilia Dharma Ecuador representative who's on this call, she presented us a little bit about the projects, various Cecilia Dharma projects in uh, Ecuador. And I was very struck by how many of them had food or um, agricultural production or things like that, values in that way, um, at their heart. There was another strand that was all about education that was quite interesting. But this, this issue of food, I know that Amelia on the call here has actually got a, a whole project all about that as well and health. So I just wonder whether or not there's some really good... Um, 
almost like sharing between you all, between us all, of what we can actually learn from this kind of uh, approach um, to share wider than, than, than Subud, but actually within Subud, but beyond it. Because I know there's another project in Ecuador called Cardo, um, which has been having trouble, but it's also about uh, rural production and support of, of farmers in the Andes about sugar, uh, the, the product that they're able to grow. So I just wonder, you know, you've got all these great things, if there was a way to try mm -hmm. and um, support that in some way as well. I don't know, I'm just putting it out there. But thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent. Um, Il Elaine, is that an old hand or a new hand? It's a new hand. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I wouldn't have brought this up if Michelle hadn't just told us about this outreach in these prison programs to lower violence. And I'm not sure you are, you may both Martin and Michelle be very aware of this, but prison gardens are also a means of lowering stress and violence. Um, there, I had the pleasure of one day at Rikers Island, the Rikers Island jail of working with the gardener there who started that garden and experiencing working with both the men and the women prisoners. And, and I, I, there are quite a few prison gardens that are extremely successful across the United States. I don't know about other countries. 150 years ago, they were the norm and they made a whole lot of sense, prisoners, in, and unlike orphans, they were expected to grow their own food. Well, what better way to use the energy of somebody locked in the jail cell than to put them out to grow food because it addresses their need for nutrition and, and doing something productive and releasing stress. And with my own research with adolescents across the country, I would say 80 to 90% of the kids that I've interviewed say working in a garden gives them peace. It makes them calm. So it's just, I mean, you're doing so many things, but you're already doing this prison work. If any of the prisons in Ecuador don't have gardens, even this, you know, simple kitchen gardens like you implement in a home are something that can transform a prisoner's day if they get to go out there at least once a week. Anyway. Sorry to even suggest anything when you're doing so many other things, but it's in harmony with all the other things you're doing. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I don't know if I can answer that, but uh, that's a, an excellent suggestion. Yeah. And I think we should actually work on that. But I'd like to tell you that not only uh, gardens are very important in terms of uh, for prison people in prison, but food as well, cooking as well is very important. When I uh, first started working in culinary social projects, uh, and I explained I was in Bolivia, uh, we were associated with uh, an organization in Denmark called Melting Pot Foundation. And they had worked on uh, rehabilitation and working with prison populations through cooking, through food. So that together with kitchen gardens, but in prisons would be a very yeah. powerful tool. And I thank you because you've given us a great idea. So thank <laughs> you very much for that. Well, I think that's part of the beauty of these sessions is that projects and project leaders can exchange amongst themselves and, and give each other I, I, ideas. Um, I'd like to wrap up quite soon, but I'd like, I'd like to invite you, Michelle, to just make any closing comments you want to, maybe um, um, comment on any of the things that, that have been said by the people who've like, made comments and asked questions. Anything else you wanna add? <laughs> well, ju just uh, thank you all for being part of this. We definitely feel your support, your presence and your interest and thank you for all of your comments, the challenges you've given us. We, it would be wonderful if we could come back to do something like this, say, after a year and talk about where we are and what has happened and talk about more results and more challenges. So thank you all. It's been wonderful to be with you. Well, thank you for having us. 
<laughs> Thank you for letting us visit your project. Um, oh, Elaine has sent the name of a book, which might be of interest to you and anybody else. Doing Time in the Garden mm. is a book uh -huh. about the Rikers Island Gardens for Prisoners. Perfect. Okay. Any final comments from anybody? I'd like to say thank you to our amazing translators, interpreters. They, they're, they're, they're here every time. <laughs> so Miranda, well done. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, Isidro, thank you. And Margarita. Margarita, thank you so much for being with us. And Zafira, again, is Zafira still with us? I'm not sure. But thank you very much for um, preparing those interviews and videos doing all the editing, that was amazing. Um, and thank you everybody for coming.